All right, let's uh, get started here. So today's lecture, we're going to continue our discussion of security, and we're going to talk about uh, non-interference, uh, which this paper uh, discusses in the context of the Certicos operating system these guys wrote and proved. Um, and just to sort of try to put this in context, so Butler gave you uh, some background on security uh, on Tuesday's lecture. Uh, so, so far, for the most part, we've looked at um, sort of functional correctness as specifications or definition of what it means to be correct. And this, in, in security terms, roughly corresponds to uh, having integrity, uh, meaning that the system is in a consistent state, you haven't corrupted it. And functional correctness, by and large, captures properties similar to integrity. Uh, so functional correctness of the type we've seen in many of the papers so far really says the system is in a good state and will give you the right answers. And that's one kind of security. You want to make sure that maybe one user can't scribble over the data of a different user. Um, but then there is a different property that Butler also uh, alluded to, which is, uh, you know, it's important to keep secrets. And somewhat surprisingly, that seems to be a very different kind of a property and uh, quite a bit different and harder to prove than functional correctness and integrity. And this is what this lecture is going to be about. So keeping secrets, the security people often use the word confidentiality to describe um, uh, keeping secret data from disclosure as opposed to keeping uh, data from corruption. Um, and one interesting thing is actually this is a bit of an open problem, not in the sense that people don't really understand what confidentiality is or how to necessarily formalize it in one way or another, but, uh, you know, practical proofs of confidentiality are still, you know, a little bit ways off. Um, so the, the, this paper is probably the closest in terms of some interesting non-interference proof of a realistic system. And still, it's a little ways off from being a, sort of a full system example of that. Um, so in particular, we'll see today some of the basics of what non-interference or confidentiality properties look like. Um, and we'll use this paper a little bit as an example of what these guys are actually able to achieve. There are some interesting things going on there. Um, but it's still actually a bit of an open question of how to deal with all the different challenges you see in non-interference or confidentiality proofs uh, and how to make this, these proofs practical, what's the right way to state these specs that's concise and easy to work with. Um, so a bit of an open problem in the practical sense. Uh, and you still see papers coming out of like, well, here's a different way of formalizing it and maybe that's a better way. Um, so uh, sort of toward, towards the end of this class, uh, you're starting to see material that, you know, there isn't really a super clear answer for. So that's the context of what we're going to be talking about. And maybe the easiest way to dive into this problem of non-interference or keeping secrets is to look at the OneDisk API. Uh, so this is the API all of you guys are familiar with in the lab assignments. Um, you had a specification of what a disk is supposed to provide. And you could imagine that maybe you want to use your disk to keep secrets between users. Um, so imagine we have something super simple, like we got a disk with two blocks. And what we're going to do with these two blocks is we're going to use the first block to keep A's data. We're going to have two users, A and B. And we'll use the other block to keep B's data. And what's going to happen is that we're going to sort of separate our system into two parts. And user A on the left here is going to interact with his block by issuing write operations, like writing to block zero and maybe reading from block zero. And then on the right side, what we'll have is, uh, you know, this other user B will issue writes to block one and they'll read from block one as well. So it seems like a sensible thing you might want to do. And the question is, how do we, you know, Turns out even here, we can see some interesting problems with reasoning about confidentiality of data. And in particular, in the reading question, we sort of suppose, like suppose the rule is, um, you know, B never calls read zero. So what this means is that user A's data is living in block zero. User B's data is in block one, seems simple enough. So if, if B never calls read zero, is that good enough to make sure that B 
never sees A's data. In other words, that A's data stays confidential. So is this okay? And I guess the answer is, of course, yeah, it's not okay. But why is it not okay? What the heck is going on? Why can't we uh, reason about confidentiality this way? And maybe a bit about like, well, what, what does this paper's observation function business have to do with this? Um, so I'll give you guys a little bit of time in a breakout session to uh, discuss this uh, and see if you can come to some agreement as to what's going on there. Um, uh, so any questions uh, about what the setup is here and what we're asking you guys to chat about uh, before we go into breakout room? Make sense? All right, so I'll let you guys chat for a bit and uh, see you back in 10 minutes. We'll talk about what is going on. Why is correctness not enough for confidentiality? Nikolai, I have one more student to assign. Yeah. Oh, hey, Caleb. Uh, do you want me to move you to this breakout room or something? Maybe. Yeah, he's typing in chat. Oh, sorry. Yeah, maybe I. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll move you there. Yeah, thanks. Let me see. Somewhere I should be able to see chat messages. Well, maybe not on my Linux machine apparently now. Um, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't see your chat messages. Um, he got kicked out and wanted to be reassigned. Oh, let me see if I can do that. Um, assign to room one. Oh, I see what happened. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Thanks, she. Happy to be a router, but <laughs> yeah, this is a slightly frustrating Linux bug. Yeah, uh, well, why is there another Caleb? Oh, I think that what happened is that uh, he his connection got disconnected, uh, and he joined a second time, and his clone was not invited to the breakout room. Uh, yeah. What's going on with Anish? I think Anish is just, I imagine, just like wants to listen to the lecture, but didn't actually answer the reading question. <laughs> uh, yes, that is correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure I have anything terribly new to say to you, Anish, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, yeah. So she, I, I wanted to ask, are there better papers that we should be reading in future years about sort of security? You mean non-interference? Oh, yeah, right, right, yeah, confidentiality, those kind of stuff. I mean, if you want to connect to uh, like the labs, like SFSCQ is good enough, right? Why not? Yeah, you know, SFSCQ is all, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe, I have a bit of a, you know, preference against assigning our own papers because then I can't complain about them as, as <laughs> or something. you know also yeah like not not really a great plan to assign mm -hmm. all of our papers mm -hmm. um what about that non-interference survey that uh she and company wrote uh, it's not great for teaching it's good if you have read other papers I think the other thing going on there is like it's a great survey of all kinds of weird non-interference stuff but it's sort of in the weeds and doesn't mm. talk about two safety sort of uh, as sort of fundamentally as this paper does and this paper does also has like weird stuff going on but like thinking of the world in terms of observers and what has to stay true across multiple executions um, this paper I think gets at that a little bit more directly 
Yeah, actually, that's a really good question. I think all the papers we have seen are, you know, they all just go into it. Here's my weird part of the interference. Uh, it's like, if you want to do Nico, let's see what the FC is first, uh, which is not something you want to do. Um, yeah. Yeah. And they all have sort of some pretty serious restrictions. So like this paper is all about determinism. At some level, like maybe that's unavoidable, but they don't even explain what you would do with a system whose spec looks non-deterministic. Uh, would you have oracles of some kind? Would you have yeah, who knows what? It's, been entire, it's never been clear to me what non-interference means when you have non-determinism. Yeah, well, what I wanted to say was something a little bit more, you know, approximate rather than like precisely non-interference. Like I want to reason about confidentiality in a system and my system, I want to have nice clean specs. Like an allocator says, I'll give you some disk block or, you know, there's a lot of non-determinism in the abstract state of exactly how it's represented, how it executes. There's a lot of choices and. Yeah, but if the allocator just says, I'll give you some disk block, that doesn't tell you anything about confidentiality. Well, okay, so you're of course precisely right that non-interference doesn't <laughs> mesh together well with confidentiality at some pretty deep level. But the question is like, what's the right way to approach a system? Uh, like, do we just have to give up concise specs that abstract away uh, details through non-determinism? Well, or... here's another angle on this um, that I, I was listening to the people in MSR Cambridge that are working on what they call confidential computing, which is mostly about uh, enclave-like stuff. But the other issue there is, how do you know that the code running in the enclave is not leaking stuff that it shouldn't be leaking by, in, by abusing the channels that it has at its disposal? And their basic, the basic strategy for that, of course, is some form of taint tracking. Yeah. Which is like, what the connection is between that and non-interference is a mystery to me. Yeah, I guess I sort of, you know, my current way of thinking is that taint tracking seems like a family of proof strategies for proving some kind of a confidentiality property. Uh, right, it's like a lightweight type like, system. Right, then iron iron have to do with non-interference. With, uh, Whatever it is you prove with taint tracking. So I, um, okay. One possibility is that a taint tracking doesn't actually imply any bigger property. It's just like the spec is taint tracking. Uh, but if your taint tracking is precise enough uh, to imply some kind of a non-interference or two safety property, then you could, like I think Anish was saying, Iron Fleet's okay. case, uh, you could imagine that if their taint tracking system was good enough, I don't know if it is, you could prove that an application that follows taint tracking has non-interference of some level form. So let's go back to the allocator example. Suppose I do taint tracking on the, on the code for the allocator and it shows and it doesn't complain. Yeah, we so know, this is basically we what we do in SFSCQ. We know that the non-deterministic spec for the allocator is not good enough to give us that confidentiality. So I think what's going on is that the spec is sort of useful for functional correctness, but then you separately have this taint tracking system or type system or whatever language you want or analysis. And if you have an allocator for which the taint tracking system says the result doesn't depend on secret stuff, then you can in fact prove non-interference about it. So this is what actually we do in SFSCQ. Uh, we have a fairly lightweight taint tracking system of sorts you can yeah. sort of squ squint at it that way. And we prove fairly mundane sort of single safety properties about it yeah. that we follow taint tracking. But then we have a meta theory also in Coq that says, well, if you follow the taint tracking rules, you can get a non-interference statement. But the, I thought we just agreed that the non-interference statement, um, well, reset. What is the non-interference statement? It can't just be that, that it gives you some block. That's not so good enough. Non-interference statement is, is about the entire file system in our case. Uh, it says that uh, if the two users will not uh, sort of see each other's data, etc., cetera. Um, and the taint tracking machinery is a 
proof technique to get to that non-interference statement without having to prove non-interference at every level of abstraction. So, so users won't see each other's data, but it's not the case that the allocations that get done are, are what is the, how does this connect with the observations about? So the top level theorem statement that we're able to prove in SFSCQ uh, is of the form that if you start out with, or like maybe one consequence of the theorem we have is that if you start out in two file system states where my observable files are all the same, but some other guys are different, right. those two states will produce exactly the same set of results uh, as viewed by this first user. So basically the first user can't learn anything about the contents of other guys' files directly or through allocation results or anything else. But Nicola, I, I think- This SFSQ is because this file system spec is, de is a deterministic spec that this works? No, I think the missing one is actually in SFSQ, the metadata, like which blocks are allocated. That is public data. That's not considered as a secret. Yeah, that's so that's what I mean by sort of taint tracking. Like we, the taint tracking system includes annotating what is the taint status of the allocator's internal state, et cetera. Um, the theorem I said uh, sort of to, in response to Butler is not a consequence of the top level spec of the system. It's sort of, it, it, is the, it is a sort of a separate top level spec of the system. There's a functional correctness spec yeah. and then there's a confidentiality spec. And the confidentiality spec is derived by looking at the team tracking results effectively. So do you think the Oracle style specs that I think Atala is working with now are cleaner in this regard? Yeah, I think you can do non-interference in many more ways. So we had various sort of weird, maybe bugs, maybe not in SFSCQ where like you pointed out a couple of them to us where, you know, like what if we crash at the wrong instant and like the file system chooses when to crash and so on. So like the, there's, there was still non-determinism left in our system in the form of when do you crash? and a couple of other things. And that turns out to be a bit of a problem for us where we weren't, our, our theorem was correct, but didn't mean maybe as strongly the confidentiality statement we wanted to have in our heads. But Adelaide's, I think, way of doing this is in some way more principled, but at the same time, it's very, it's like, it lacks a clean logic for how do you go about proving stuff. Like there's nothing equivalent to whore logic or separation logic in Adelaide's world. He just, just like brute forces his proofs. Uh. But do you think this is something that could come out of the work? Like after brute forcing a bunch, he distills that reasoning yeah, principles. Maybe. I guess the, the problem is, yeah, we're like we, we don't even sort of understand what the, state machine way of looking at this is correctly. And then maybe we'll have a program logic afterwards eventually. But... Mm. All right, well, I guess everyone's back. So let's uh, see, what do you guys think? Uh, maybe I'll, uh, anyone wanna volunteer and say what you guys, uh, what you guys came up with? And maybe I'll pick on, uh, I don't know who, uh, Julian. Yeah, sure. So one of the things that we uh, realized was that the read spec, the non-determinism in the post condition of uh, like disket being uh, maybe equal to R, um, we could have an implementation that uh, for like any out of bounds read, we could just return like the uh, the information in block zero. And so you could, with that implementation, you would still satisfy the spec um, while at the same time, you could just read an out of bounds address and get the information in block zero. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, absolutely. So I think this is the one big story that this paper is talking about, which is that, you know, non-determinism is a big problem for confidentiality. Um, so one example to maybe give a little bit more flesh or meat to the uh, case that you gave is imagine the bad block remapper from uh, a couple of labs ago where maybe you had a, like this one disk API is just a spec for something that looks like a disk. Maybe what's going on under the covers is that we have a three block disk where block zero is bad. 
So what this means is that um, the sort of logical view is we got a two block disk. Block one is implemented by block one, but then we remap block zero to be block two. And reading and writing block zero and block one all work fine. But if you issue exactly an out of bounds read on block two, then our spec was actually set up to, as you say, allow out of bounds reads to return whatever they feel like. And it's quite natural in this implementation to say that, well, if you go to out of bounds read on block number two, well, you will just sort of fall through to this block that was exactly A's data. That was actually the remapped block zero. And you will legitimately get out uh, you know, zero's contents. So fairly natural to even have this mistake. And then you're absolutely right that the spec doesn't pin down the expected result of the read for other out of bounds reads as well. So if you read, you know, some other block 99, also the result could be anything, uh, and including could be either z this block or this block or anything else. Uh, so I think that's uh, a key part of what uh, sort of interesting to understand about non-interference or sort of confidentiality in general is that it's really hard to sort of reconcile confidentiality or non-interference with uh, non-determinism. So that's a big sort of theme going around through this paper. Uh, and indeed, it seems to be tricky to do right. Um, most solutions to this problem, uh, including this paper, what they end up doing is really getting rid of non-determinism. Uh, this paper is pretty aggressive. They basically say everything must be fully deterministic. Nothing can ever sort of have a non-deterministic choice, which is safe in some sense with respect to this problem. So they, this paper's view would be that ah, the one disk API is not a good API because it's not deterministic. You should have really said that out of bounds reads return all zeros or all ones or whatever, something very concrete for every out of bounds address. And then we'd be good to go because uh, we wouldn't have this non-determinism problem. That makes sense? All right. So that is indeed, I think, one of the big issues this paper is looking at. Um, anything else you guys were stumbling onto? I think it took a little while to actually like guide to this simple answer, but uh, Caleb did have a more complicated situation involving a crash. Uh huh. So I think actually Caleb did come up with this answer we had a while ago, Nikolai, uh, with uh, Asli's work, where I crashes see, are dependent yeah. so on I guess, the secret yeah. data. Right. So like, there's actually many sources of non-determinism potentially, right? Like maybe the spec is non-deterministic. And this is the example that we have drawn out here in the bottom right. The other possibility is that the execution model is non-deterministic. Um, and they're not necessarily exclusive, right? Like probably the execution model is part of the spec, but qualitatively, um, I guess what Caleb was uh, getting at is that um, crashes are kind of a non-deterministic event. Even if your spec for disk get is perfectly deterministic and says that, uh, you will get all zeros if you read out of bounds. There's still this choice of a crash that can happen at various times. And that's a little bit harder to get rid of because fundamentally there is this non-determinism that like, you know, your computer could, like you could unplug your computer or you're, you're, you might lose power at any time and the computer will stop running. And informally, I think the reason that's actually fine is because the fact that you lose power is unrelated to the data you're trying to keep secret. But when we start to formally model stuff, that's not so clear. So maybe an implementation could force a crash in various ways, who knows what that means. Uh, if it turns out that A's data is all zeros and it doesn't crash if A's data is not all zeros. So anytime you have non-determinism in your model or specification and you're trying to reason about confidentiality, you should be thinking in a very adversarial way, uh, meaning that you should be trying to figure out, could an adversarial implementation leverage this non-determinism and make the non-deterministic choice in a way that reveals the secret data? And in the case of our disk API, the answer is, yeah, you know, the implementation could do something unfortunate here. 
In the case of other non-determinism, you gotta think harder. So in the case of crashes, maybe, maybe not. Um, probably doable in the case of crashes indirectly. So what I mean is, uh, suppose that you call, uh, suppose that user B here wants to learn if A's data is all zeros or not all zeros. It's like one bit of data, but still interesting enough to try to leak. And maybe the implementation here is gonna be pretty simple if B tries to read something and A's data is all zero, the implementation of this bad block remap or whatever, will just keep spinning, waiting for a power failure. Kind of a strange thing, but yeah, it could happen. And then a power failure will occur, then you'll reboot and you say, ah, you know, crashed, probably was all zeros. On the other hand, if you, if you try to read, if user B tries to read from the disk and A's data is not all zeros, the reader will return right away. You could have crashed, but there's a small chance of a crash. The other guy has a long chance of a crash. Um, so these are these are hard things to reason about. Uh, so uh, fully deterministic systems are much easier. And uh, I think this is part of what I meant by an open problem earlier is that not super clear what's the right plan or approach if your system is not deterministic at some level, like multi-core or uh, crashes involved or networks involved. How do you deal with this non-determinism? And how do you argue that it's not leaking secret data? That's still a tricky proposition. Um, but even in this sort of fully deterministic uh, setting, still interesting stuff to talk about. And we'll, we'll sort of chat about that. Um, so there are some in issues, uh, like you guys pointed out, there's various sources of non-determinism that lead to um, problems for confidentiality. Another thing that I wanted to point out, um, uh, it's like slightly of a, you know, funny answer to this question is that um, there might be other APIs. And what I mean by this is that I wanna get across that confidentiality is not just a property of read. So it might sort of intuitively seem like protecting users data is a property of the read operation. And you could state something about read in order to argue about whether users A, user A's data is safe from user B or not. But in fact, confidentiality is really a property of all APIs that might leak the state, not just read. So maybe a simple example might be, instead of implementing this two block disk on top of the remapper, like we have in the example on the right, you could imagine implementing this two block uh, disk on top of something else, like uh, maybe you wanna deduplicate disk block contents. So you know, it's actually kind of commonly done in virtual machine systems where lots of logical disks share a lot of blocks because everyone installs Linux on their VM. You wanna save space by deduplicating blocks. So maybe what happens is that um, you have an implementation that does dedupe of disk blocks. And this means that if two blocks have the same value, they actually only store one copy of this value on real disk. Uh, and as a result, you might have also an API that has something like, you know, get, you know, used blocks that return the number of blocks that are actually used. And in this case, it might say one if they're shared, or if they're not shared, you might get the answer two. So it seems like it has nothing to do with the read operation and whether data leaks, but you can indirectly learn what the other guy's data is. So if I'm user B and I wanna learn what A's data is, what I'll do is write various data contents to my block and keep calling get used blocks. For the most part, it'll keep saying two, two, two because uh, I'm using one block, the other guy's using one block. But if I randomly happen to write the same block as the other guy has, then all of a sudden get used blocks will say one. And now I know that I guessed the other guy's data. And now the guy's, the guy's data is leaked without B ever having read it directly. So the point of this example is really to illustrate that sort of confidentiality is not just about read. So we can't really imagine a spec for just the read operation and say, ah, read is confidential, like we can't read the bad, bad guy's data. It's really has to be a property of uh, all the things that might happen in your system. Does this example make sense? Any questions about it? All right, so let's talk about how we might um, 
try to actually specify confidentiality in a good way. And this is what sort of non-interference really um, does for us. So in order to specify non-interference, the intuition is going to be something along the lines of the following. So um, what we want to say is that uh, you know, B's execution or whatever B sees should not be affected by A. And these are the kinds of properties that this paper in particular focuses on. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that if you remember from Butler's lecture, he talked about security being sort of isolation and sharing. And this paper doesn't really have much to say about sharing. It is almost entirely, I think entirely, about isolation between uh, different processes and, or executions or users. Um, they don't really have a strong sharing plan at all. Um, but uh, interesting to see how do you formally reason about isolation for them. And the interesting thing, the, it turns out that this non-interference specification, specifying this statement that I wrote down, is actually quite a different kind of a property than what we've seen so far. And to describe this, uh, let's look at the way we've talked about some execution satisfying a spec before. Um, the way we've thought about it is that we have a system executing along. So for example, we have a state, then what we have is user A, you know, probably does a write to block zero of the value 10. And then user B comes along and writes to his block the value 20. And then something else happens. So I guess in our case, B is going to call read out of bounds on block two. Why not? So the problem here is that we want to look at this execution and say, is that a good execution or not? Uh, and that's the way we've really thought about uh, system correctness so far in this class is we look at traces of execution of a system like this trace, and we look at it and say, is that good or not? Well, in this case, suppose that read two returns 10. Maybe that's a hint that, you know, that's a bad value to return because it seems to be equal to 10. Uh, but you could equally well imagine a situation where this returns zero. Well, I don't know, is that good or bad? You know, do we have non-interference? Are we keeping the data secret or not? The problem is that it's actually kind of hard to decide by looking at one trace because what we really want to see is not just whether the literal value 10 appears here, but whether this result of the read of two or any other operation for that matter, as we saw in the previous slides example, we want to see if it depends on the secret in any way. And it turns out it's hard to do by just looking at one trace. And instead, what you really have to do is look at two traces. So here I'll use the green color to illustrate a different trace. We start out in also maybe the same state or you know, in this example, let's say we start from the same state, but then what we're gonna have is user A has to make a different write. So instead of writing 10, user A writes 11. And then user B is gonna do the same thing, write his 20. And then user B goes ahead and does the same read of two. And now the question is, do we get the same value out? If we still get 10 or we still get zero, whatever the case was, then actually it's totally fine. If it's 10, that's not a problem because clearly it's unrelated to this 10 or 11 that user A was writing. On the other hand, if we see that this execution produces the value 11 over here, um, so let's say this was the case and this was the case up here. Well, now we have a problem. We can look, look, in this trace, user B was doing all the same stuff and got the value 10. And in this execution, user B was doing all the same stuff again and got the value 11. The fact that they're different allows user B to distinguish what user A was doing. And clearly, this is not satisfying our goal of trying to keep B's execution independent of A. So the way to think of this is that sort of non-interference is sort of a property about two executions. Or more formally, uh, people call it a two safety property. And the way to think of it is that if you remember our regular safety property, um, what makes it a safety property is that you can present an execution and say, that is bad. 
And as a result, if you say there are no bad executions, well, every execution is going to be good. Uh, two safety properties, like no interference, are properties where you got to present sort of pairs of executions to demonstrate that something went wrong. So evidence of a system misbehaving is a pair of executions, like this blue and green execution on this slide. If I show these to you, you would say, oh, yeah, something's leaking because these guys should have been the same because from B's point of view, he was doing all the same stuff, but now a difference emerges. So that's what a, this two safety property means uh, in non-interference. Um, and uh, you know, it requires some slightly different machinery, like what this paper tries to develop, in order to formally reason about uh, these properties. And what you sort of have to answer in order to do this kind of a proof, well, I guess you need some kind of a plan for proving non-interference here. Um, but in order to define um, this a little bit more precisely, you really have to answer sort of a couple of questions. So, um, you know, what data is confidential to begin with? So, um, what makes this sort of right by A special? Um, and uh, why is that okay? Or like, why are these differences important and these differences might not be? Uh, and also you have to sort of define, you know, what data gets observed or exposed from the system. Uh, at the end of the day, we have a single system, so something is going to be different when it's executing. Uh, but then certain operations like B reading uh, is a thing that we really have to protect. It's okay if internally there are some differences because of A's uh, state, uh, but all the outputs to user B have to really stay the same and not leak uh, A's uh, information. Does that make sense to some extent? Any uh, questions? Yeah, quick question. So you mentioned, uh, I guess, already that like uh, the third class paper and I guess the approach is to make everything deterministic so that this actually works out. And I guess to be more precise, like is the point that like you need to make things deterministic so that a violation of this two safety thing actually is just two executions. So like if things are deterministic, then all you need to violate your like high level confidentiality uh, guarantee or whatever is two executions that look exactly like what you said. But if there was not determinism, that wouldn't really cut it, right? Is so like there's a couple of things going on. So um, there's non-determinism at the spec level, and then mm -hmm. there's non-determinism at the execution level. So mm -hmm. at the spec level, the non-determinism is kind of annoying for the reason that if you have something non-deterministic at the spec level, it might not actually be possible to see that non-determinism at the code level. So the spec might be giving a lot of leeway justifying unsafe behavior. So in order to keep, in order to prove non-interference, you basically have to have the same amount of non-determinism at the spec level as at the code level. So mm -hmm. every time the spec says that something can go two ways, you have to actually have the code also be able to go two ways. And I think that would help you keep this at two safety property. The, there's also non-determinism at the code level. And that turns out to be tricky for a different reason, which is that whenever you have non-determinism at the code level, it also must be realizable. Um, in some sense, it's a similar kind of a property that I'm talking about with the spec, but what it means is a little bit different. So uh, your execution must actually be capable of going both ways, uh -huh. which you know, might be true in some settings, but in reality, like, okay, imagine a multi-core system. Uh -huh. You could model the code execution as, you know, you know, any thread could go at any time. In reality, that's not really true. And um, what's going on under the covers is probably very close to being deterministic, just uh -huh. hard to pin down what that determinism is. Uh -huh. And as a result, even though some executions appear to be legal according to the execution semantics, they might not actually be realizable. So if you use those executions as sort of the justification for why, oh, that execution is possible, the adversary might know better. <laughs> so if the adversary mm -hmm. has a more precise execution semantics, they can sort of rule out your fake executions and learn that some things are impossible. I see. First, yeah. But it's Sorry worse for the than that. Answer. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, but it's worse than that, it seems to me, because um, as you pointed out, the charm of the safety property, 
safety properties that you can, can exhibit one bad trace, but two safety properties don't really have that property because it's possible that the reason that 11 shows up there is that what the code is doing is generating, when, it, when you do an out of bounds read, what the code is actually doing is um, returning a result from, eh, that it gets from calling the hardware as a random number generator, which might be 11. I, yeah. think, I think you had, to incorporate uh, probabilities, you have to fundamentally change what it means to observe something. Well, I didn't say, to, you know, I don't have to say anything about probabilities. I can say that, that I can have a, 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 something deterministic that depends on some piece of internal state that, that you can't observe in the spec. Yeah, I think, I think in that case, what's going on is that your, the specification is too weak to justify such things where the actual justification would involve something about how the system hardware random number generator is uncorrelated with secrets in some way or another. All I was trying to say was that it doesn't seem to be sufficient to, be, to, to just exhibit these two traces and say, this proves that you don't have two safety. Yeah, actually, sorry, I went off a little bit on the wrong direction mm -hmm. answering Upamanyu's question. I think, um, right. as Butler points out, um, if we had non-determinism, then you look at these two executions and you say, yeah, I totally could have been fine. You really did read the random number generator. And the way, here's another sort of you know, unsettled question of what's the right way to do it. One way to do it, that's pretty popular, is to make the execution parameterized on some kind of an oracle that chooses your randomness for you. And then the statements are of the form, if you have an execution on top with a certain oracle, like these are the, the sort of, the Oracle outputs that the random number generator will produce these answers. And you can produce an execution at the bottom that uses the same Oracle, meaning we know the random number generator produced the same randomness, but still the answer came out 11. That's a violation of two safety. So typical or one approach for dealing with non-interference in the presence of non-determinism is to introduce these Oracles and what you do with the Oracles is you sort of transfer them between executions to say that the same randomness you had here is now the same randomness you'll have in the other execution. And now if you observe differences, ah, they came from secrets. So I understand that. What other way is there to do it? I don't know, but it's not terribly satisfying. And that's why people keep looking for other ways <laughs> to do it. People keep trying to find a better way, but so far they haven't succeeded. Yeah. And I guess the other, the other the, the reason I sort of say it's not super satisfying is I think there aren't sort of big examples of verified systems beyond this Certicos paper that really prove interesting interference properties about system software. And I sort of view that as a symptom that like something is quite hard here. Like maybe we'll figure out how to do this Oracle stuff and it'll work out. But... Well, it might be also be worth pointing out that there have been a number of attempts to field real systems that have some sort of non-interference property. And when they get into trouble, it's for totally different reasons than the ones we've been discussing. Yeah, that's a good point. Main, so, mainly because of the fact that people actually do want to do some sharing. Right, so there's sort of an interesting disconnect here. So the formalism I'm presenting for reasoning about keeping some data secret is this very rigid notion of non-interference that talks about two safety and these two executions not exhibiting any differences whatsoever. People have tried, including us in some form or another, to build systems that provide very strong non-interference guarantees and, you know, possible to do this plus or minus epsilon. But then these systems often become very difficult to use and program because they enforce extremely rigid isolation. And uh, it's difficult to share resources as a result. And it's difficult to write software that uh, respects such strong isolation boundaries. And if you do write that software, nobody wants to run it. Right, it like probably satisfies a spec that is too rigid <laughs> with respect to what you wanted, yeah. Um, so it's not clear. I guess the, the other kind of open problem in this space is how would you formalize confidentiality in a way that's not as strict as this kind of non-interference I'm presenting in this lecture? That seems to be a little bit of an unclear thing. There's some other variations that people have looked at. None of them, I think, have worked out super well. Like some of them are 
not very foundational definitions. Like you just say, well, you know, what it means to be secure is I'll follow these rules. Uh, like taint tracking, just to give you guys something to Google for if you're interested. And like your definition of security could be, I do taint tracking. But it's not clear what it implies because it's susceptible to this, uh, to flip back one page, it's uh, susceptible to this other API problem where maybe you perfectly well follow the rules for reads, but you forget to follow the rules for get used blocks or things along those lines. And uh, well, maybe your spec isn't as useful as you thought. Well, taint tracking will tell you about that, won't it? I guess it depends on how precisely you define taint tracking. I think if you define taint tracking extremely precisely, it boils down to non-interference and then it's as useless as non-interference. And if you define taint tracking a little bit more loosely, then it's easy to leak some site information like this example on the left. Um, I don't think that's quite true because if you do it with taint tra tracking, then you can be fairly explicit about the case cases where you're willing to allow the information to flow. I see, yeah, so maybe some kind of, yeah, exception rules, yeah, possible. Um, so I guess as you guys can see from this discussion, like far from being a settled question of <laughs> what to do in yeah, this is, case. These are great research opportunities, guys, and there are people with money who actually want better answers to these questions. So if you have any ideas for better answers, go for it. And we have, I guess, actually a couple of our students are working on like several projects in the space, you know, they're fun to play with, but uh, even they, you know, I wouldn't claim they're the answer. They're sort of probing various little tidbits here and there. Um, but anyway, let's sort of maybe keep going, trying to look at this particular system to just to build up intuition about one approach to confidentiality with its flaws of being maybe too strict. Um, so what I wanted to describe is, uh, I guess, this paper's approach. Um, and as we talked about uh, in this paper, they are extremely bullish on determinism. And uh, they have deterministic specs. So not too surprising, as we already talked. And they have deterministic code. What I mean by this, just to be precise, is that what it means for the spec or the code to be deterministic is that given some state, there's exactly one transition that you can make from that state. You know exactly what the next step is and where it'll put you. And there's never a question of being in two possible states. And there's never a question of not being able to go to any state. You can always take a step, go somewhere. Uh, maybe that's a little bit too strong. Maybe you can get stuck and have undefined behavior of some sort and just prove you never reach it. But for all the reachable states, you always know where to go next. Uh, and then sort of the extra thing we haven't really talked about very much is this notion of an observation function. And this is their sort of hammer for proving and even writing down those non-interference statements that I was drawing in diagram shape on the previous board. And what an interference, what this observation function is, is really a function of a principle, which is the entity like user A or user B, that's the principle. And then there's a state and the result of the observation function, you can think of it as really the subset of the state that the principle can observe. So that's the sort of syntactic or you know, low level details of how these observation functions work. And the reason, what's going on in this observation function is sort of a strange combination of being both a spec for what you want the system to protect as well as an ax, it's like this weird thing. We'll talk about this in a second, but there's sort of three things going on in this observation function. It's sort of a spec of what you want uh, to be protected. It's also a model of what is leaked at the code level. And it's also an inductive predicate that helps you do these inductive proofs over and over and over. Um, so it's satisfying sort of these three roles of being inductive and specifying both the spec and the code uh, leakage properties. Um, so maybe the best way to try to understand it is to really think of these observation functions as being two different animals when you're applying it to the spec level versus the code level. So if you have a spec level observation function, then what's going on is that, of course, you have this function O, it takes a principle and a spec state. And what it returns is 
basically the parts of the spec state that should be readable. So this is sort of the definition, you know, P should be able to, you know, read this part of the state. And should be able to, what I mean here is, uh, oh, sorry, uh, undo that. Um, should be able to really, it's, is okay. Uh, it's not necessarily that uh, it must be possible for P to read all that stuff, but it's really a statement that says it's okay if P reads all those parts of the spec level state. So this is sort of a, uh, implicitly a definition of what is confidential for other users. So this implies what is confidential for other principles, P prime not equals to P. So basically anything that is in S spec, but not in this observation function for user P, all that stuff is confidential for some other user. So it's sort of a you know roundabout way, if you will, of defining what is confidential by instead specifying in a positive way, saying here's exactly a bound on what every user can read out of the spec level state. And this is totally at the spec level, so that's kind of cool. And then there's a different use of the observation function for code level. And what's going on at the code level is the syntactically the same thing going on, of course. You have a P and S at the code level. And what the result of this is, again, it's a part of the, it's a subset of the code level state, but here, what has to happen is that these are the sort of externally observable things or transitions. So the way to think about this observation function at the code level is that it's really stuff like, you know, the output to P's terminal, or maybe it's, uh, you know, packets sent to P's computer. So the spec level function uh, describes what we want to get, uh, what, what, we, what we think is readable and everything else is not readable. The code level observation function really is describing what is definitely readable at the code level. So you can think of them as sort of being, trying to bounce stuff in opposite directions at the spec level and at the code level here. Um, and there's some relation between them. Uh, so the relation to sort of think about is that, um, you know, uh, spec versus code observations. Basically the, what's the right way to think of this? Um, it's really uh, that the code level observations have to be a subset of the spec level observations. That's one way to think of it. I'll sort of phrase it in two different ways. So really observation on the code level state has to be sort of a subset, if you will, of the observation on the spec level state. So everything that the code level observation function says you can observe, the spec has to also say, oh, that's also observable. So in other words, yeah, if the observation function at the code level says, oh yeah, P can observe the stuff that gets printed out to his terminal. Well, in that case, the equivalent of P's terminal, the spec level must also be included in the spec level observer. So this is really a restriction that comes out in this paper because they use uh, these observations for their sort of inductive proofs as we'll see in a second. Um, maybe a more mathematically precise way to state this requirement is that um, Imagine that you have two states. You have a state at the spec level S and S prime, and then you have code states. You have C and C prime. And what's going on is that you have these guys, of course, related by your abstraction relation. So this subset property, um, what I mean by this is that if for some reason the observers at the spec level agree, then this implies that the observers at the code level must also agree. So if you're in two states where, as far as the spec is concerned, these are identical things, then it can't be the case that there's any differences that you can observe in reality at the code level. If the spec says these two things are the same, the code has got to be the same too. Otherwise you're like exposing some differences that the spec doesn't even see. Um, so this is sort of a constraint on these observation functions that this paper needs in order to make this inductive and make their whole approach work. Um, 
but in some way, I, at least for me, it was easier to understand their observer business to re by really thinking of it as these two kinds of observation functions that are sort of defining the spec, what you want, and then defining the leakage model or exposure model at the code level. Does that make sense? Questions about this so far? All right. So let's try to use this observation function and see how they actually make their non-interference proofs go through. So there's basically two things that um, they want to prove, I think. Uh, so how do you prove of non-interference in, in their approach? So the goal, if you will, is uh, basically to prove a statement of the form, you know, if you start out, you know, start out in, uh, you know, states that uh, have the same spec observations. So the plan is you have some states where as far as the user, some user is concerned, these states are identical. The whole subset of the state that the user is allowed to read, that all is the same. Uh, so you start out in any state with the same user level observable, and then you execute for you know, any number of steps. And then you must observe same results at the code level. Because at the end of the day, only the code level is real. That's the only thing that actually sends data out of the system. The spec is totally a logical way of thinking of it. So the statement we want to prove is something of the form. We start out in states that satisfy this nice spec level definition that they're sort of indistinguishable. The user can't tell which one it is. And as long as we run for any number of steps, we'll get the same results, regardless of which state we started from. So let me try to draw this out. Um, so there's going to be a lot of like four executions going on here, which is a little bit tricky. I'll try to keep them separate with maybe some kind of a color. Uh, so here we have two spec states. So we got our S0, and we'll also have our S0 prime. I'll use the prime to indicate the sort of two safety states. So S0 and S0 prime are going to be states that uh, basically agree. So I'll use this twiddle line to basically say that, well, the observables, according to our user, are the same in S0 and S0 prime. As far as the user is concerned, you shouldn't be able to tell them apart. The spec says you shouldn't be able to tell them apart. And what we'd like to do is say, we'll start from these two states. There's, of course, some code level states corresponding to them at the bottom. And uh, let's draw them out, I suppose. Um, so here we have C0 and C0 prime. And what's going on is, of course, we have our abstraction relation. Uh, maybe I'll use a different color for the abstraction relation. So here we have our abstraction relation, R. And what we'd like to argue is that we're going to run these guys along and get states like you know, C1 and uh, so on. Uh, drawing too many different things. And eventually, you know, we'll get to some kind of a state Cn over here. And we'd like it to be the case that the observable stuff here in the CN is the same as in this other thread of execution. So we have C1 prime and so on, CN prime. So what we'd like it to be the case, the sort of the, the assumption here is this, that we start out on two states that are indistinguishable spec level, the goal sort of a more formal statement of this informal goal at the top of the slide is that the observables that you get from the final code level states are the same. And the reason this should capture, I think, confidentiality for you guys is that, uh, just to sort of argue why this is a good definition, is that there's no way for our user to learn anything about the system that wasn't in their read set or their sort of spec observation function because no matter how long they run and what they do, they will always observe the same stuff. There is no way for them to tell the two states apart, even though there might be some differences, like the secret stuff of other users. <laughs>
So that's the goal. And the way we're going to actually prove this is going to be by reasoning about spec level state executions instead of sort of dropping down this way. So if you will, in the goal here, I sort of started with a spec, immediately said, oh, yeah, there is a code level execution right now that corresponds. And we want to reason about what happens to the code level execution. The way the proof works in this paper is that instead of arguing directly about the code level, they actually first argue about the spec level transition. So what they say is that, you know, imagine there's some transition from S0 to some kind of an S1 over here. And um, imagine there's a corresponding transition to an S1 prime in this alternate green universe. Then sort of the obligation one, you know, proof step one, is going to be to show that the observables here are also equal at the spec level. So this is sort of the first part of your proof st step is that you have to prove that your spec, so this is all about how the transition function works at the spec level. This is not talking about the implementation at all. Just their deterministic spec preserves the observable that we chose. So for example, if we uh, say that user A is allowed to read block zero, then whatever operations user zero does can't change uh, the observables for uh, that user. Does this make sense? Any questions about this sort of first part of their proof step? You can try to rephrase it in a slightly different way, which might be a also helpful to try to understand what's going on here. Um, so what, what's basically going on is that um, you're having to show in showing this uh, transition from one state having being indistinguishable to the next guy being indistinguishable. So what's going on is we're basically showing that there's no way for us to start out in two states that look the same and somehow make them look different. If we can make them look different, well, that's a problem because they should have been indistinguishable. But if, we if all the states that look the same stay looking the same, then you can then apply some kind of an induction and say that, well, it's going to hold for a, any number of steps. So you prove that for one step, observability equality holds between two states. Then by induction, this holds for any number of states at the spec level. So that's the first part of their proof strategy. And the second part of their proof strategy is to go down from this proof, uh, so from equality of spec level observables down to equality of code level observables. And that's this restriction that we saw on the previous slide. On the previous board, if you will. Um, just to flip back there, what I'm referring to is this constraint that we are talking about. If we have two states that are indistinguishable from another at the spec level, then they must be indistinguishable from other from each other at the code level as well. So this constraint on these observation functions, basically that the spec has to include all the stuff that the code observes, that allows us to lower our equality of observables from the spec level down to the code level. And sort of, if you will, what we wanted to prove is sort of around this way, going this way. And the way we actually end up making this proof work is we actually go step along the spec level up top and then we drop down uh, when we get to the desired code level uh, state. And just to maybe step through uh, one uh, sort of extra argument here, um, the way they make this proof go through is they sort of argue that uh, you know, every transition must maintain this property that you can drop down and maintain equality of these observable states. And you might have uh, code level states that make some, uh, that you might have code level states that didn't actually transition to spec level state. So, you know, you run some x86 instruction at the bottom, but it actually still corresponds to the same logical spec level state. So in that case, what's going on is that um, because you correspond to the same spec level state, your observables at the code level are still equal because of this lowering restriction. So observable of C0 must be equal to observable of C0 prime. That's because we just started on these equal states. So we can draw this squiggle. If we correspond to the same state as before, we can preserve the squiggle because we can just lower this equality of observables from the spec to the code. 
And then if we actually take one step at, one, at some point, then um, there must be uh, preservation of observables at the spec level uh, according to this sort of proof step inductively. And then we can then lower it again to the right code level state for us there. It's a little bit tricky to draw these four executions. So hopefully some sense, some <laughs> part of this story makes sense. Uh, maybe I'll ask for questions and maybe that'll be a good way to clarify things that seem particularly confusing. Any comments, questions, clarifying things that seem unclear here? All right. So one way we can maybe try to build a little bit more intuition for this stuff is um, let's talk about what if we get our observation function wrong? So um, one thing we might ask, uh, let me, let's try to sort of draw somewhere out here in the corner is, uh, you know, what if the, what if the spec observer is wrong? So how bad can it be if we get the spec level observation function wrong? So suppose that the observation function includes nothing. Could this proof go through? Like the observation function is always empty. Could we push this proof through? At some level, saying that it's empty means that there's nothing in the system the user is allowed to observe whatsoever. Probably there's something in reality that he can observe in the system. So where the proof is gonna fall apart is actually the inductive step at the top level, at the spec level, everything looks fine. You could observe nothing here, you could observe nothing there, you, you never observe anything. But it's really this lowering step that fails because at the code level, you probably do observe something like the output to your terminal. And there, you wouldn't be able to prove this lowering restriction. If you start out from two states at the spec level that have the same observables, well, any two states have the same observables because the observable is always empty. Then you wouldn't be able to prove that the code level observables agree. So some kinds of broken specs at the broken observations at the spec level will be caught by the proof. Other kinds are probably just going to specify too much for the user. So for example, if the observer at the spec level says, you get the whole state. Well, this proof inductively is gonna be easy to carry through because the only way these states agree on all the state is if they're literally equal. The whole proof becomes very easy to do because you're talking about running in the same state. Uh, there are no possible differences. So proof is easy to carry along here. It's also easy to lower, presumably, because if your full state is equal, then the observables at the code level also are equal. So the whole proof goes through, but it's not super meaningful because your spec just said, we're proving that the user can read anything. So it's not much of a security constraint. There's nothing really we're preventing here in terms of reading sensitive data. And it makes sense because the spec is in some ways trusted here. Um, for what the user should be allowed to see through the user level, through the spec level observer. Another thing we could try to talk about is, you know, what if the code level observer is wrong? So the code O um, is not specified correctly. Well, again, there's probably two directions in which we could have specified it wrong. If the code level observer says that too much stuff is observable, meaning that it's not just the output to P's terminal that's observable, but actually the whole system state is observable. It's a pretty aggressive statement. And probably what this means is that the system might actually be secure, but we'll have a hard time proving that it's secure because according to our model, we're leaking the whole system state all the time. So if the code level observer says a lot of stuff is observable, we'll have a hard time proving that the system is secure, even though maybe it is secure. But if the proof goes through, we're actually in good shape. That's actually fine. Um, on the other hand, if the code level observer is too small, and what I mean by this is that if the code level observer says, you know, only P's terminal output is visible, but actually it turns out you also print out some other stuff publicly somewhere, and you don't mention that on your code level observer, well, in that case, your theorem 
might be provable, but not super meaningful because you proved that you have confidentiality with respect to printing output to P's terminal, but who knows if you're printing secrets to some other just destination or some other output. So it has to be the case the code level observer precisely models what is observable so that you can reason about what these observations leak out of the world, on, out into the world. So both are part of the spec and you have to get them right at some level, but hopefully this gives you a little bit of intuition of what exactly you have to get right about these two observation functions. Uh, so there are sort of bounds in different directions. So the spec level observer can't be too big. Otherwise you're over specifying, you're giving the user too many, too many rights to look at all kinds of confidential state. And the code level observer can't be too small. If it's too small, you're not describing all the ways data can leave the system. So these are sort of the two bounds, the spec and the code level. Hopefully it helps a little bit. So this all full story wouldn't help us with the <laughs> number of blocks in use problem. So I think with the number of we blocks in use, that, then, sorry? Then our proofs will all go, still go through just fine. So the way I imagine uh, in, in the number of blocks in use case, uh, probably what you would describe is that the logical state of the system at the spec level consists of the blocks of your two disk block you know, system. And the observable says you're allowed to read the contents of your block. And I think the horizontal proof would work out just fine, but maybe the lowering would be problematic because at the Well, actually, no, never mind. Actually, at the, at, the, at the spec level, I think you would have a hard time proving it because uh, what the spec for get used blocks would say is that it would say, if the two blocks are equal, I'll return one. If the two blocks are different, I'll return two. And then if your spec level observable says you get to observe your own block, then two states where your block is the same might now produce different outputs at the spec level for get used blocks. And you would have a hard time proving that your observables stay the same. I guess your observable also returns their, includes the return value of the thing you just invoked. So I think that, that that's the place where it would fail. I think we'd actually catch the get used blocks problem here uh, with that observation specification. Now, if the observable spec somehow says, well, you can observe whether you, what your block is and also how many used blocks there are, well, that's sort of indirectly, uh, yeah, that's a different problem now. Other questions about this? All right. So this is sort of the overall story, uh, kind of independent of the Certicos artifact that these guys proved in the paper. Um, so the last thing I wanted to chat about is how these authors actually apply this whole non-interference observer story to their operating system. Um, so this is a question of, you know, how do they actually prove this M, actually, no, it's not M certicost, maybe I forget. There's so many variants of certicost in various papers. Uh, so how do you prove certicost um, uh, to be secure using this observer machinery? And uh, there's some interesting tidbits, uh, you know, I'm not gonna go through the whole proof of how they make it fly. Um, and there's some imagination required to figure out exactly what their proofs mean. Um, but um, at a high level, uh, the way they set up their framework is that a principle in a system, in their system, is really a process in an operating system. And what you basically have to imagine is that there's some kind of an output terminal for every process. So every process has its own sort of, you know, console, if you imagine, and that prints out all the output coming out from that process. And this is, I think, uh, what they're imagining is going to be kept, uh, you know, secure, uh, or like, you know, the output to this terminal uh, is going to have non-interference with respect to what other processes are doing. And then the observer that they define uh, is going to be basically you know, a function of this process ID and some state. Um, it's basically the virtual memory of the process uh, and the registers if you're running. So this is an operating system, right? So it's gonna context switch the same machine between multiple processes. 
And a process might be currently running on the machine, in which case your observer says, well, you get to see the current registers of the CPU because they're your registers. Uh, but you might have been stopped and now the processor is running someone else and your registers are saved somewhere else. So your observer might say, well, you know, you can actually observe your saved registers uh, and that's if you're not running. So that's the way they sort of set up their observer at various levels. Um, and you also get to observe this output to the terminal for every process. That's what sort of keeps their proofs honest in some sense. Uh, there's a couple of interesting tidbits they ran into. Those are probably maybe the interesting things to talk about uh, where they couldn't quite make their proofs work out and they had to actually tweak something. Um, so here's one interesting proof issue that they ran into, um, which has to do with uh, virtual memory uh, modeling. So as I mentioned here, the observer in CERTICOS is uh, allowed to look at the contents of the virtual memory. So here you have a process P and logically it has a virtual memory that might consist of, I don't know, three pages of memory. And they have some values, maybe they have zero, zero, zero. And at the implementation level, so this is the, the spec level, the process has this virtual memory. At the implementation level, of course, there's more stuff going on. So there's a, some sort of a page table that configures vir virtual memory. And then there's actually physical pages of memory that's not virtual. And it's possible that the page table uh, maps multiple virtual addresses to the same physical address. So it might be the case that these two virtual addresses are both stored in this physical page containing zero. This guy is a separate page. But as far as the process is concerned, if you just expose virtual memory as the observable, well, this looks like your state, it's all zeros. And what they ran into was kind of an interesting case in their proof was if you start out, like remember one of the things that you have to prove to make uh, this proof go through is that if you start out in two states that are equivalent with respect to the observer, you end up in two states that are still equivalent with respect to the observer. But here's an interesting corner case, which is that suppose you have two states, you start out, they're all zeros as far as the spec is concerned. But at the code level, a different realization of this all zero state might be a different page table where every virtual page has its own physical page. These guys are the same as far as the spec is concerned at the starting state. But then if you write to address zero, the value five, then what happens? In this case, this changes to five and this also changes to five because they're aliased. In this other configuration, only the first page changes to five. And now you used to have states that are indistinguishable and all of a sudden you've distinguished them. Now, this isn't strictly speaking a problem or a leak of some confidential data yet, but it makes their inductive proof not go through. So what they had to do was actually expose the configuration of the page table as part of the observable. I think actually what they probably, I think what they did is actually they required that you can't actually alias pages this way, which means that uh, you will never have this configuration. Uh, but uh, that's kind of an interesting situation where you really have to be more precise uh, about specifying the state in which your system is currently in. Uh, not sufficient to just have the observables being your virtual memory. You also have to describe the structure that might, uh, you could infer by writing to various locations. Never mind non interference. This, this, if you, if you allow this implementation of the spec for the three pages of virtual memory, it's not going to behave like a memory. Yeah, potentially. You know, in Unix, you could certainly get into the situation, and you know, sometimes it's actually useful to have the same data mapped in multiple virtual addresses. But but that's but then that has to be exposed at the spec level. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So I think they they were a little bit naive here in writing down their spec as just the contents, the visible contents of reading the memory locations, and indeed rightly. That seems like a perfectly fine spec, and that would rule out this particular implementation, Independ entirely independently of non-interference. Yeah, I think if they spec it out as you have to have all these pages behaving like regular memory, you would rule it out. I think what they started with is specking it out as just, here's the current contents that you would have if you read it. And that doesn't exclude necessarily. So, so the they, weren't, they didn't actually specify a memory. That's right. They just sort of specified it in one state as opposed to the dynamics that you would have if you read and write those locations. Um, the other interesting issue they had was um, at the API level. Um, with PIDs, um, 
so what, what actually happened is that in their operating system, like in many others, you have some kind of a fork system called that returns a PID. And the way they implemented it is that there was a global counter that uh, described the um, next PID to allocate. And this global counter revealed information across processes. So the way to think of this is I fork a process and I get the value five, then I wait a little bit and I fork and I get the value seven. Well, this means that someone else forked in the meantime and got the value six. And now I can know that, yeah, they called fork and another execution, maybe they didn't call fork and I learned something. So this is the kind of side channel that um, you have to prevent if you try to get non-interference. And in practice, this basically doesn't matter. So this is the example, this is the category of stuff that Butler was alluding to earlier where these strict non-interference systems are really um, hard to use in some ways because they have to close down channels like these PID allocation channels. Um, that's probably too much and too aggressive for practical purposes. And it's unlikely that you, you know, your password or your bank account will be hijacked because you leaked your PID counters. Uh, depends on the setup. You know, I'm sure you could cook up some example, uh, but in practice, this is not how any realistic system gets attacked. Um, so what they change is actually they have a different allocation strategy for PIDs that doesn't leak information anymore. Um, it's probably more instructive just to understand what kinds of problems lead to issues for their proofs. And maybe the most interesting example uh, uh, actually has to do with uh, these local semantics that they talk about. Um, so the problem for them is that they had to prove non-interference at the spec level, starting from two states where your observables are the same. And that means the state of your process is the same. This says nothing about the state of other processes. So the situation that could happen is that at the spec level, you have your state S0, and then we have the green state S0 prime. And suppose that our process P is gonna call yield to allow another process to run. And our blue guy also does the same because it is in the same state. And now we end up in this blue state. Now some other process P prime runs. You know, P prime does something, P prime does something else. And then eventually P prime calls yield and gives control back to P. The problem is that the number of steps that P prime takes in this blue execution might be different from the number of steps that P takes in the green execution. Maybe in the green execution, P prime is immediately going to yield and give control back to P. And now the problem we have is that we had this correspondence between states, the squiggly line here, but we've lost it here. These guys do not correspond. And especially sort of once P keeps running, now these guys are really different. Sorry, I used the wrong color at the bottom here. This should have been, should have been green, but uh, you really lose um, synchronization between the executions and this inductive proof doesn't go through, even though you know, there's probably some notion of non-interference that holds. And they have this clever trick of local semantics that I'll sort of describe as the last thing here. The way they do it is they look at the execution up here as one level that's not quite the top level of their execution. So what, what they think of is that you start on some state S0, then P calls yield, then P prime does something, then P prime does more stuff, and eventually P prime is gonna call yield and give control back to P, and now P runs, you know, does some operation X. What they do is they actually construct another level of abstraction on top of this, another spec, where the starting state S0 sort of corresponds here. And then when you call yield, all the other states that the other process takes are basically the same state. They all sort of correspond to this state. It doesn't actually matter how many steps P prime does. And it's only when P prime yields back to us that we actually start making progress again. So here's the simulation diagram for their local semantics. So as far as this top level spec is concerned, the process called yield. And then at the implementation level below it, P prime ran, did some stuff, who knows what, but eventually it stopped running and P ran again. And now you can see P just does sort of a yield followed by whatever it was gonna do next. And by reformulating the execution 
of other processes using these local semantics, they're actually able to prove non-interference between executions of a given process with respect to the local semantics of that process, even though the execution with these global semantics doesn't, strictly speaking, preserve their notion of non-interference. So that's kind of a cool trick worth you know, having in your mind if you, if you ever run into similar situations. All right. So that's all I want to say about Certicos. Any other questions, comments, issues? All right, so that's that. Uh, feel free to head out. Uh, we're past the end now. Uh, if you have questions you want to ask afterwards, we'll stick around and feel free to hang out as well. We can answer more questions then. Otherwise, uh, have a good Thanksgiving break and we'll see you guys on Tuesday. We'll talk about uh, sort of paper that's analyzing what's the relation between formal verification and actual security of systems and how much benefit is there to formal verification. See you guys then. <laughs>